problems. We don't have the young people got children go to the children's message. We have no nursery today. No nursery today. No babies. They need to get busy. They need to get done. Cook. They said to keep you on how about the little one back there? Does he want to go to the nursery? Praise the Lord. Well, this morning, I'm going to sand against the grain. We all know that it's easier to sand with the grain. Mm -hmm. yeah. Always, always easier. <laughs> In all aspects of the life, just easier to go with the grain. <coughs> but sometimes we have to go across the grain. And this morning, mm -hmm. I'm going to go across the grain this morning. And I'll explain what that means in a moment. But I want to say this. This here is what we call a Bible. God calls it His Word. And it is the Word of God. It's not a book about God. It's not a book concerning God. It is the Word of God. And it's comprised of 66 individual writings or books to make what we call the Bible. And through the years, as God led individuals to write and then to pull together and bring together and translate in the various languages, we come to have this wonderful book we call the Bible. In most Bibles, there's you'll see notes, either on down the middle of the Bible, at the bottom, the top, down the sides, but there's notes written in there. And those are exactly what it says. They're notes. They're not part of the Bible. And the note written by man in the Bible to clarify something is no more than found it in, in a commentary or a dictionary or an encyclopedia. The scripture is a scripture. Everything else is notes put there by man. And as we read the Bible, as we study the Bible, and have been doing for many, many years now, the church, we tend sometimes to, to fall in a rut. Mm -hmm. And we start accepting things that's just not in the Bible. Yeah. Uh, I remember a long time ago when I heard a, a statement, if, 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 if a lie is told enough, it becomes the truth. Well, that's a lie. A lie can never be the truth. It doesn't matter how many times it's repeated, repeated, repeated a lie is never the truth. And the truth is never a lie. But over the years, I believe that Christians and churches have found themselves believing what they've heard or what they've read from man over what God says in his word. I, I, you know, I, I hear people all the time say the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, and I think the Bible don't say that. Man says that. And this morning we're going to cover a couple of things. Really, going to be three sermons in one. Hopefully, it won't be as long as three sermons. But it's going to be. We basically go go over three things: two in the Scripture, one that kind of blends in to, on the third one. That I believe that. Man has misunderstood. I'm going to go against this morning probably every commentary that you'll pick up. I'm going to go against the majority, if not all, the professors in the seminaries and in the colleges. I'm going to go against what's been preached in, I believe, the majority of churches, maybe all the churches, and in the Sunday school classes. I'm going to go against what I've heard all my Christian life. But I don't believe it. I think that this morning 
event and events that we're going to cover from God's Word as we continue the book of Genesis. We are in the still finishing up the third chapter and going into the fourth chapter. I believe over the years that sometimes we'll say, well, it could have been this way, it could have been that way, this may have been it, that might have been that, and we hear that enough so we start believing, well, that's the way it is. So this morning you're going to have the privilege of hearing what I believe God has told me it is, rather than what the professors or the commentaries, or the notes in the Bible may say it is. And I hope you'll listen very closely uh, to the message this morning. And, 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 and don't cut me off because I'm, right off the bat I'm probably going to say something you're going to disagree with. But don't cut me off until we get through and see why this is important. And it is important. It's, un it's important for us to understand how God deals with us. And a lot of people, let's put it, the, lost, the lost world, a lot of them has a picture that God's a mean old man. He just waiting to get you. you know? he, he got a sickle or something, he just waiting to cut you down. And that's just not true. God's a God of love. And God has made... All the provisions for us to have an abundant life on this earth. And the reason most people don't have an abundant life is because they don't go by God's plan. They make their own plan. And that just doesn't work. Now, having said that, if you found Genesis chapter 3, if you stand with me, and I'm reading God's word, I'm going to read chapter 3, verses 21 through 24, just as our, our base scripture, and then we'll, we'll discuss uh, some more scripture too. <laughs> Unto Adam also, and to his wife, who was Eve, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us. And that for man there is not male, but the man meaning mankind. Is become as one of us. To know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the humans, Adam and Eve, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubim, that's the ones with wings, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. The way of the tree of life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. We ask you to bless that reading, Father. And for the moments ahead, we ask the precious Holy Spirit for a fresh anointing. To bring forth the word that he would take your servant, body, soul, mind, and spirit. And that through your servant, the Holy Spirit will speak the truth to us today. Father, not to be contrary or trouble to others, but Father, to understand how much you love us. And in return for all you do for us, really, how little you ask of us in return. Father, bless this message this morning in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Last week, we looked at the consequences, or the consequence, rather, for sin. And that consequence of sin is that it separates humans from God. And in doing so, it diminishes and it desecrates the relationship God desires between him and us. When God created us, he had the deepest desire that he could have, that he could come with, or possibly as God be there, to have with us. And we blew it. Human blew it, not God. God has never failed. 
God has never been found unfaithful. God is always successful. But it's his creation that fails him. We left Adam and Eve last week in the garden naked with some fig leaves that they sewn together around them. God was explaining to them and to Satan that they started something called sin. Sin is disobedience to God's word and God's will. Mm -hmm. Which will plague mankind until the end of this world as we know it. This day we're going to take you up right where we left off with the ones, uh, I think, a couple of very controversial statements even before God actually threw them out of the garden. So let's get to it. Verse 21, the coach is in. The Bible very simply says, Unto Adam also and his wife did the Lord, all capital, Lord God, Lord God. make coats of skins and clothe them. As I said last week, this, these fig leaf aprons that Adam and Eve made, that's the attempt of man. That's what it signifies. They tried to cover up their sin their own way. They try to produce with their own, within their own abilities and with what surrounds them a covering for their sin so that God would not see them naked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why were they naked? They, they didn't have any clothes before. They were naked because they had lost that perfect standing with God. That's what disappeared. None of their body disappeared. They didn't have any physical clothes on to disappear. So the only thing that disappeared when they committed sin and forbid, took of the forbidden was that that perfect standing with God was dropped. And man became imperfect for the first time. As we have seen so far in this book, God has been making regular provisions for the needs of mankind all along. From the very beginning, which we're still in the beginnings, but God has looked every way, left and right and front and backwards, to provide for the well-being of mankind. His provisions for man were perfect. Absolutely perfect. There was no room in God's perfection that he placed Adam and Eve for them to want more but then old Satan came and he didn't do a whole lot he didn't have a whip, he didn't have a sword, he didn't have a spear he didn't have fire all he had was his voice mm -hmm. and that was enough to bring Adam and Eve from a place of perfection to a place of imperfection why does God do so much for us? Because we are his prized creation. Mm -hmm. Of everything God has created, we are the prize. Nothing else. They needed clothing. The Bible says God provided. Mm -hmm. When Adam and Eve became unfit for God to see, God provided a covering which might allow them again to live in God's presence without them being afraid. They were unfit for God to see. They were unfit to talk to God. So God put a covering on them that made them fit once again to talk with God, to hear from God, to receive from God. And yes, we can say that's a symbol of what Christ did for us. Mm -hmm. He made us fit before God. The controversial part is not the clothing, but rather where did God get it? God made them clothing. The Bible says coats. But it wasn't a coat like I'm wearing. It was a coat meaning a covering. And I'll mention more about that in a moment. Mm -hmm. Well, where did it get it? Get the covering. 
First, let me say, this is probably not controversial to everyone. It's accepted what's said worldwide. It's not controversial to almost everyone. It's probably not even controversial to a large number. It's probably just me. However, if it's controversial to me, it's controversial enough. As I said, I imagine that every commentary, regardless of what name on it, that you pick up, every note in the Bible that you might have, every preacher you listen to, not they, not all, say some agree with me, but it's, it's a minority. Now, chances are, every preacher you've ever heard preach, every teacher you ever heard teach, said this. God sacrificed animals here for mankind. Is that not what we've always heard? Adam and Eve was naked before God. What they provided was not sufficient to cover their sin. And that the word is God sacrificed animals for the skins to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness. And that symbolizes the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross and what he did. What I'm doing this morning is telling you I don't believe it. I don't believe there's any evidence in scripture to say that. And that's what I want to share with you. Why I say that. So that's what I'm saying. Don't give up on me. That is something that as far as I know has been accepted among Christians and in churches for, uh, since we've been here, since it's been around. God killed animals, peeled their hide off, and threw them on Adam and Eve. Made them look like a tuxedo. What we've always heard. We like to hear that. We like to correlate that with the crucifixion of Christ on the cross. And in a way it does. I'm not saying it doesn't. I'm saying it's where he got them, how he got them, this I'm dealing with. So let's look at our text and see if God sacrificed animals. <clears throat> Chapter 3, verse 21. God made coats, meaning coverings of skins. That's not disputed. The word coats here means coverings, not coat. The word skins here is the word or. It's, it's spelled in English O-R-E, which means skin as naked, and by implication, hide, leather, or skin. That word or comes from the root word ur, spelled O-O-R in English, which is a primitive root meaning to be bare or be naked. So God made coverings of skins which is normally used in the Bible for animal skins. And that's not disputed. We all know that usually in the Bible where it talks about skins, it's talking about animal skins. That's not disputed. We pretty much agree with that. Now, that sounds very good. It sounds very holy. Am I right? So why am I so brazen to say that it's not correct? I question it for two reasons. Now listen to my reasons. Where in this scripture does it say God killed animals? Where? Where does it say that? Nowhere. Does it say that? Does it say God killed animals, skinned the animal, put skin those skins on the animal? It doesn't say that. Well, preacher, we assume there's where we go wrong. We can't always assume if God's word doesn't say it. When we start assuming, we cause problems and we cause troubles. Well, what else could he done? I'm going to tell you in a moment. I'm going to tell you what the Bible said he did. Where in this scripture, number two, does the word sacrifice appear? It's not there. It's not there in the Hebrew. It's not there in the German. It's not there in the English. It's not there in the Portuguese. Not there in French. 
Sacrifice is not there. So, if God had sacrificed the animals, don't you think we would know it? As a matter of fact, now listen to this, listen to this close, because I won't, I won't make sense. I know you're saying, boy, he's, he's wacky now. We've got we to get him committed. <laughs> but I'm going to show you some things. Where is the first time that sacrifice appears in the Bible? Anyone know? Don't say that loud because you'd probably be wrong. <laughs> the first time that the word sacrifice actually appears in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 31 and verse 54. Now let me read it to you. Then Jacob offered sacrifice upon the mount and called his brethren to eat bread and they did eat bread and tarried all night in the mount. Do you know how far that text in Genesis 31, 54 is from this text here in Genesis chapter 3? I'm going to tell you. It was after Adam Adam was 930 years old when he died. I told you I was going to tell you how we start, how the true way to date this earth, as we know. That's in Genesis chapter 5, verse 5. 930 years old when he died. So when, uh, when Adam died, the earth, as we know it, was 930 years and five days old. Now from then you read through all the verse and the dates and all that and you tell exactly how old the earth is. As we know it. Now remember the little gap there at the beginning? If there was something on this earth before, we don't know that could have been millions of years old. But as far as the earth as we know it, when Adam died, this old earth was 930 years and five years old. But this is past that. It was after the great flood of Noah. Noah was 600 years old when the flood started. <clears throat> the earth as we know it was 1,656 years and five days old when the flood started. Don't forget that five days. It was after Abraham, Lot, and Isaac it was near Jacob's life that the word sacrifice appears. Usually if I ask somebody when to sacrifice, when the first sacrifice, I say, Abraham, I got news for you. Read the Bible again. Abraham did not sacrifice his son. Why? He didn't sacrifice Lot. He was willing to. God stayed his hand. The Bible doesn't call that a sacrifice. What does the Bible call it? An offering. It doesn't call it a sacrifice because Adam did not actually sacrifice his son Lot. He was being willing to. I mean, uh, Abraham. Abraham, I'm sorry. Abraham and I, that's what Let me get back to my notes because I don't want to get too far off here. So my point is that sacrifice is not mentioned for more than 2,000 years after this sin of Adam and Eve. Why? You think God, God had a had a had a had a, a, a void in his mind? Do you think something as critical as sacrifice that when God instructed Moses as to what happened here that God forgot to mention sacrifice? Moses is not busy writing, Lord. I hope he had a typewriter if he, if he wrote bad as I do. But he's bad. He, Moses is busy recording. God is filling all Stuff out to him, and when he got here, God forgot to say, and I sacrificed animals. Don't you think?
think something as important as the first sacrifice, if it'd been here, it'd been important enough for God to put his word. So my conclusion is God didn't sacrifice animals. God did not have to kill animals to the hide. I don't think so. When God made all the animals, that's in chapter 1, verse 25. When he made all the animals, where did he get their skins? He made them. What did he sacrifice for to make them? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> now, I don't know what kind of skins. They may have been bear skins. Maybe a bear skin coat. I don't know. Might have been leopard skin. Might have been wool. Lamb from the lambs. But when God created animals, he didn't get their hides from anywhere. He what? He made their hides. Yes. Now what does the Bible say that God did here? Made them. Made them. <laughs> Didn't say he killed anything. He crucified anything. Well, how could God make them? Say the way he made them to start with. That's right. If God can put a hide on skinny bones, on bones, he can put a hide on naked man. Well, preacher, is this really going to make a big difference in what we believe? Probably not. But what the next thing I want to say is going to probably make a difference. Mm -hmm. The point is that we need to understand how God's dealing with us and also how God deals with the rest of the universe. When God wanted to cover my sin so that I could be his child, God didn't go out and crucify somebody in Egypt or somebody in Iraq or not even somebody in California. When God wanted my sins covered. The sacrifice came from God. He didn't do anything to anybody else. Right? Just like Hallmark. He cared enough to send his very best. And that is his one and only begotten son. Let me ask you, for, from everything we've seen God doing so far, is there any reason for us to believe that God would sacrifice these animals and not tell Moses? I don't know. That's not like God. Not like God at all. All right, second point. I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to have to do some summarizing because I won't get to another big point in just a moment. So God says human has become like God, knowing good and evil. Well, they already knew the good. So the part about being like God was the idea of evil. God knew evil. He knew what evil was. He knew what it was going to do. But Adam and Eve did not know it until they started they sinned. So God ordered that Adam and Eve leave the garden. Verse 23. God says, you're out of perfection. You can get out of perfection. You can't live here any longer. You've got to get out. Move on out of here. Get out of here. Okay. Get this. Apparently, they didn't want to go. Can you blame them? No. no. Oh, hey, Dad, it's, it's a cruel world out there. Father, that's a desert. Remember, you got the Garden of Eden right here, and everything around it's desert. Are you kidding me? You're my father. You're going to send me out into the world? I'm going to leave all these graves and tangerines and apples. And I'm going out there in the desert to eat roots and plants that grow out of the desert. 
A new king may leave verse 24. Then God drove them out of the garden. He said, get on out of here, both of you. You don't deserve this garden. You're not worthy of it. They said, hmm, where are you going? I guess they thought they was living today. Well, we ain't going. You know us. God said, let me show you. <laughs> You're out of here, Jack. He drove them out of that garden. I don't blame them for not wanting to go. I mean, they would have had sense enough to know by now. Don't argue with God. <laughs> After getting kicked out of the garden of the desert, Adam and Eve had a son named Cain. Mm -hmm. Chapter 4, verse 1. Mm -hmm. Eve then, in verse 2, boy, she didn't wait long, did she? No. She waited one verse and gave birth to a second son and named him Abel. Chapter 4, verse 2 says that Cain was a farmer and Abel was a shepherd. King James says, but Abel was a shepherd, but the word for but, the word for that, same thing. <clears throat> it is this part I want to look at in conjunction with sacrifice in verses 4 through 7. The Bible says in the process of time that passed. In other words, they're out of the garden. They had two babies, two males, two brothers. It says that Cain and Abel brought an offering to the Lord. The Bible says offering and not sacrifice. No sacrifice has been mentioned at this time. They didn't bring a sacrifice. They brought an offering. We passed the offering plate this morning. How many of you put a dead cow in there? <laughs> Come on, preacher. Heard you bring one of your dead goats? I could have killed a squirrel if I had one every morning. I said, we're back and forth on the power line. I can get him anytime I want. <laughs> We didn't put any dead animals in that offering plate. It wasn't a sacrifice. It was an offering. I guess this would be a good time for me to tell you the difference, right? Well, preacher, what's the difference between sacrifice and offering? Offering. The difference is between here and heaven. That much difference. Let me give you the three things and give we got. It. One is the tithe. Now, when you think about tithes, where would you think you'd place the tithe? Way up here? Uh-huh. The tithe's the bottom. The lowest thing we can give to God is our tithes. Well, preacher, why is that? Because that's what we owe him. Yeah. We owe God our tithes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, I'm not preaching on money this morning. I try to not do that for about every five years. The tithe is a debt we owe God. So when we bring it, it's called tithing, which means we brought to God what he's told us to bring. The next one is offering. That is that beyond the, that tithe, we bring a gift to God or to God's work. To be applied to whatever it needs to be to get the job done. It's an offering. It's an offering of appreciation. God, here we paid our debt to you, but we want to put this in there too. We love what you've done for us. We love you. So in addition to the tithe, we're given the offering, and it really doesn't cost us anything. Because God says we can't outgive Him, and whatever we give as an offering, He's going to multiply it back to us. Now, that's not hard to do. If you can give God $10 and get back 12 that's not hard to do. I'll do that all day long as long as Linda's got $10. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings us to the third one sacrifice. 
Sacrifice is that which costs you beyond what you normally want to give yep. or do. God told Abraham, bring your only son, Isaac. Mm -hmm. Now what the scripture says, not as a sacrifice, bring him as an offering. <clears throat> now this is, this is deep, get this, but church. God told Abraham, bring Isaac as an offering to me. But then God added something. God says, I want it to be a burnt offering. Wow. Now, most dads would say, oh, God, you've gone too far. I'm out of here. Take me, but you don't take my son. But Adam, Adam Abraham didn't do that. He told his son, he said, son, we're going to go up on the mountain and make an offering. I know some Bible says sacrifice there, but the word is still offered. Word is still offering, yeah. He said, let's go up on the sun, I'm going to make an offering. Well, what are we going to, what kind of an offering? God will provide himself for him. He still hasn't told Isaac what God told him. So if God, Abraham takes Isaac up on the mountain, and they gather the sticks to build a fire. By the way, Noah, he too, made an offering. Some Bible translate that sacrifice, but it wasn't, it was offered. So he, they filled the fire. Isaac, the boy, looks around. Father, <laughs> we've got the fire going, but what are we going to put on the fire to sacrifice, to offer as a burnt offering? Well, son, it's you. Imagine hearing those words. Son, it's you. Isaac went screaming and squalling and running. I'm mama, mama, mama. No, he didn't. <laughs> Isaac said, okay, Dad, whatever God wants. Isaac got up there and laid down on the back wood. Abraham took that knife, drew it back, and just as he made that motion to come down, God said, stop! I just want to make sure you're willing to give me everything. Take him off of there. <coughs> he looked over there in the bushes. Looked over there and one of the prairie's billy goats. It was a ram, though. He said, there's the one. Now, was Isaac sacrificed? No. Was that lamb sacrificed? Yes. And Christ is known also as what? The Lamb of God. Yeah. Sacrificed. The Lamb was sacrificed, not Isaac. Isaac was the offering, the Lamb was a sacrifice. If, if, if God had allowed Abraham to go through with that and literally kill and, and, and burn uh, Isaac on that altar, then Isaac would have been a sacrifice. That sacrifice means it hurts. Beyond paying the debt, beyond offering something, sacrifice is that. So, here we go on. Let's go on. I want us to see that conjunction here. The Bible says that Abel brought of the first one First one of his flock. That firstling, it means he, the firstborn, the one with the birthright, the fat one, the richest, the choicest one. And God had respect for Abel's offering, but not for Cain. 
what the king brings. Now remember, Abel is a shepherd. So when it came time to bring an offering to God, what did he have around him to bring? A sheep. Cain was a farmer. So when God says, in the process of time, whether their dad told them, whether God told them, we don't know exactly who told them to bring it, but they were told to bring an offering, what's around Cain to bring? Vegetation. I don't know if it's corn or what, but I'm sure he's growing something to eat. Not having all them lunch vines in the garden. Abel brought what he had. Cain brought what he had. Now at this point, they're equal. They both bring in what they had. The difference between the two is that Abel took this offering so precious that he didn't go out and bring a spotted sheep or a sick sheep, sheep or a dying sheep. Now, be, be careful of the meat you buy off the side of the road. A lot of meat comes from sick cows. Anyway, he, didn't do that. he picked the very best he had. Cain went out in the cornfield. We're going to call it corn. Cain went out in the cornfield. How many of you ever pulled corn? Quite a few of them. You got corn out there, you're going to pull it, mean you pull it up. All right? You pull the sugar back a little bit in there and you see if it's how fruity it is in there. What you want to see is kernels all the way from the bottom to the top, right? You want to see these beautiful, delicious looking kernels of corn. And if that kernels go all the way down that cob, all the way around it, boy, that's a great ear corn. And you'll find those. But sometimes you start out the silk, that old silk, isn't that a mess to try to get out? They get silk, try to clear. Uh, yeah, no corn, just cob. No corn, just cob. I have taken a ear of corn that big and had that much corn right at the bottom. You cover it up with your fingers when you have it. That's what Cain brought. Cain didn't think this was such a big deal. Cain knew that they were going to want to eat this corn. So instead of bringing this big, full, rich ear of corn, Cain brought that that was just partial. Sometimes it would be like that. Sometimes it would be up, up the side. Here curl, there curl, everywhere curl. They're like sniping teeth. So Cain's offering, God wasn't too happy with it. Cain was very upset and angry with God because he didn't accept it like he did with his brother. And he's also upset with his brother because he and his offering were preferred over his verse 5. God said to Cain, this is word, God's word to Cain. God said to Cain, why are you sad? If you do well, shouldn't you be accepted? He said you do perfect. Mm -hmm. He didn't say if the air corn is full. He just said if you do well, <clears throat> shouldn't you be accepted? That would be Abel. Abel did well. But if you don't do well, that would be Cain. Mm -hmm. Then sin lies at your door. There again. Doing less than what God wants us to do is sin. Yep. In whatever it is. Not just in go out and commit murder. Whatever God wants us to do and not do it is sin. Whatever God does not want us to do to do it is sin. Mm -hmm. One is the sin of commission. The other is the sin of omission. There's a lot of badness sinning this morning. Well, I'm always starting with them on, on, on faith. Well, we're not going to where to say we ought to go to church. I said, try the New Testament. <laughs> Come on. Read the New Testament. <laughs> Jesus said, I will build my church. 
And all through the New Testament, they went to church. Went to a preacher. The church was in a home. So what? I don't care if it's in a barn. Go. I'm not saying it has to be a cathedral like this. If the church is in a home, go to that home. If the church is in a barn, go to that barn. If the church is in a pup tent, go to that pup tent. But if God has provided a nice building with heating and air conditioning, which I'm, it's getting summertime, I'm going to have to make a request to y'all. You won't be freezing out and not wear a coat when I preach in the summer. I think that's going to be the answer. Oh, where they get to? Okay. <clears throat> in that same verse 7, God speaks to Abel's Cain's present, in Cain's presence. Unto thee, Cain, shall be his desire, that's Abel. Now, most of the time we read that and we think that God is saying, Cain, Abel's going to have to do what you tell him to do. I mean, you've got to do what Abel tells you to do. Unto thee shall be his desire. Cain, you've got to do whatever Abel desires. And he goes on to say, and thou, I'm getting close to the end, and thou, Cain, shall rule over him. Abel. What God is telling Cain, no, Abel's not going to rule over you. I'm happy with Abel. I'm happy that he brought the first of his flock to me. But Cain, don't get down and out the mouth. Abel is still subject to you. Preacher, why is that? Because Cain was first born. Right? No. No? Abel was first born. Okay. Yeah. You had it back. I had it back. Okay. So Cain now is to be servant to the older one. 